10 years after its release, Geometry Dash has made multi-millions in revenue and is more popular than ever. But what if I told you this wasn't the first game about a cube jumping over spikes, and they actually got the idea somewhere else? In this video, we'll discover how Geometry Dash achieved its ridiculous success despite stealing its core gameplay from another game. This story begins on November 23rd, 2009, when an indie game developer called Fluke Dude launched his very first title, The Impossible Game. The only information about its development process comes from an interview where he says that it took him only one month to go from the idea to the final product, and that he worked on it while taking a break from his larger project called Sci Fighters. In The Impossible Game, you're tasked with making a cube jump over spikes and on top of blocks. As an extremely simple game that features only one level and one button, it's a hard sell compared to other high-quality console games. Fortunately for Fluke Dude, Xbox Live had a separate service where indie games like this one could thrive. The only records I could find regarding how well this game sold is from Fluke Dude's account on X. Apparently, it became the best-selling Xbox Live indie game between its launch on Xbox Live and when the iPhone port came out in April 2010. The Impossible Games iPhone port exposed it to a rapidly growing industry where games had less budget and development time than on console, putting it in a better position to succeed. Despite its lack of content, it was very successful on the App Store, going from the top 100 to one of the top 3 paid mobile apps in the US. Pretty solid, right? But this is nothing compared to what its clone was about to do. The Impossible Games' success on both console and mobile platforms was enough to grab the attention of Robert Topala, aka Robtop. Unlike Fluke Dude, Robtop had launched a couple titles before Geometry Dash, so he had a slight advantage in terms of game development experience and knowledge. He noticed that the Impossible Games' gameplay was very addictive, but the original developer didn't do that much with it. A couple more levels were added in the early 2010s, and while that slightly extended the game's popularity, that's not enough to foster a large community. People would either beat the game or give up on beating it, then delete it and move on with their lives. That's where Rob Top saw his opportunity. The plan was simple. Take the jumping cube idea from the Impossible game and build on it as much as possible. He even used the same engine, Cocos 2D, to build the foundation. This quote from Rob Top says it all. It simply started as a template with a cube that could crash and jump. Through different iterations, I then kept adding more and more features and content until the game felt right. After four months of part-time development, Geometry Dash launched on iOS and Android on August 13th, 2013. It featured seven levels with some new mechanics like jump pads, reverse gravity, and a portal that turns you into a flying ship. Instead of trying to make the levels hard like the Impossible game, Robtop made the first seven levels relatively simple and more welcoming for new players. Although Although we don't have exact information on how many people downloaded the game at different points, the sentiment from both inside and outside sources suggests that Geometry Dash was not immediately successful. If these seven levels were all Geometry Dash had to offer, it would have met the same fate as the Impossible game. People stop playing and forget about it. This is why Robtop made sure that two crucial features were in the launch version of Geometry Dash. The first of these was a level editor, where users can create and share their own levels. In other games, like Fall Guys for example, the level editor doesn't get added until several years later, but being available on launch was an absolute game changer. A level editor allows your game to sustain itself through community-made content, so if it's added later, it doesn't factor into people's first impressions of the game. There are many games that flop because they launch incomplete with plans to finish it later through updates or DLC, but once you're done with the first seven levels of Geometry Dash, you can find an unlimited supply of of levels. Aside from just having more content, it opens up the possibility of more challenging levels. This could appeal to people that played the Impossible game, or people who are skilled at games in general. No matter how good you are, there's always a level where you can meet your match. Overall, the level editor allowed Geometry Dash to hold its current audience and make it so there's unlimited content to keep playing the game for. The second crucial feature was Everyplay, which basically allowed users to record their own gameplay and share it. 
If the level editor was responsible for holding the game's current audience, every player was responsible for bringing in new players. Robtop said that the reason for Geometry Dash's success was word of mouth. It's as simple and frightening as that. Instead of having to personally invest time and money into marketing, he had faith in his community to grow itself, and all he had to do was give them the tools to make that happen. If your current community is staying, and you also have new players coming in, then the player count can only go up. But this story doesn't end with the launches of the Impossible Game and Geometry Dash. Each title had significant updates which left a major impact on where they stand today. Geometry Dash was updated monthly through January 2014, which is impressive for several reasons. Each update introduced a new mechanic along with a level that used it. Consistently pumping out major updates without getting tripped up by bugs is something very few developers are capable of. Even if other people can do this, Robtop also had to motivate himself to make monthly content for a game that had a slow launch. 1.1 introduced Mirror Mode, which was used in Time Machine, 1.2 was a new ball form in Cycles, 1.3 brought the Gravity Pad and Gravity Ring in X-Step, 1.4 had the Size Portals in Clutterfunk, and finally, 1.5 added the Theory of Everything level, which features a UFO form along with purple pads and rings. If you bought Geometry Dash at launch and kept playing the game, you were eating up all this new content. On top of this, new content in the game means new content which can be used in the level editor, strengthening a core player base that was steadily growing. It's also worth mentioning that every time a level was added to the paid version, another level was unlocked in the free version, funneling in more players who were on the fence about paying money for it. Meanwhile, the Impossible game hadn't seen any activity during 2012 and 2013. Instead, Fluke Dude was working on other projects like Sci Fighters and Mayan Slice. He did express interest in porting the Impossible game to PC, but the timing of his next move makes it seem like he was motivated by the steady rise of Geometry Dash. In May 2014, Fluke Dude partnered with Grip Digital to port the Impossible game to PC. But that's not all. The PC port includes a level editor like the one in Geometry Dash. On the surface, these two moves look like they would do a lot to boost the Impossible game's popularity. Now, I'm not going to criticize Fluke Dude for adding content to his game, but there were several reasons why this wasn't a game-changing move. First of all, there wouldn't be much interest in a PC port for a 4-year-old game which lacks the replayability factor that Geometry Dash has. People already played it back in 2010 or 2011, when it was accessible to anyone who had a phone. So there's not really a new market for the impossible game to reach by moving it to PC, a platform that less people can afford to play games on. Although I understand that making a level editor work on mobile is not easy, Robtop was clearly able to do it on the same engine. So in theory, Fluke Dude and Grip Digital could have used Geometry Dash's level editor as a template to follow. If the level editor was added to the mobile version, it would give some of the previous players a reason to come back but people probably didn't care enough about the Impossible game to the point where they'd move to PC for its level editor, especially when Geometry Dash already does this on the platform where they used to play the Impossible game. Robtop broke his monthly update streak in February 2014, but he made up for it by releasing version 1.6 in March. I believe this update was the turning point where Geometry Dash started to really take off. Secret coins were added to all of the levels, giving players a reason to return to the previous ones. You can use these secret coins to unlock Club Step, the first level with demon difficulty. Robtop started appealing to the hardcore player base, who was itching for levels that were very hard and had the level of polish that only Robtop himself could provide. Electroman Adventures and Club Step featured invisible and breakable objects objects, which require more of the player's attention to navigate. In my opinion, this is the earliest update you could return to that made Geometry Dash feel like the game it is today. Geometry Dash was ported to PC in December 2014, and like many mobile games that moved to PC, it had a relatively slow start on its new platform. Steam Charts is the only place where we can get active player counts for Geometry Dash, and it shows an interesting pattern. It climbs significantly in popularity for about a year, then plateaus for a while, then it climbs again and plateaus again. This takes us all the way into the 2020s, where recent developments have taken place with both games. After seven years of radio silence on Twitter, suddenly this a teaser for the Impossible Games sequel. Twelve years later, fans of the original game finally have a reason to come back. 
four months pass between the announcement and release of the Impossible Game 2 on mobile. This makes me wonder if releasing and announcing on the same day may have helped it attract more players, because the announcement tweet got over three times the amount of likes as the release tweet. Despite all of the advancements that Geometry Dash has made, the Impossible Game 2 still found new ways to innovate, such as platforms that move when you jump, enemies that you can jump on, and even a boss fight. It focuses more on interacting with the level around you than powering up your character, which I think is a cool way to maintain the simplicity that the original game had. They also made a ton of visual improvements and retained the level editor, and overall, it looks like a very good sequel that rivals the gameplay of Geometry Dash. It took a year and a half to port it to Steam, where it reached an all-time peak of two concurrent players. This video might dunk on the Impossible game for not living up to the insane virality of Geometry Dash, but the least I can do is encourage more of you to support the Impossible game too. Meanwhile, Geometry Dash kept receiving updates until 2017, which added three more portals, three more forms, and three more colors of rings. Robtop can only add so much to Geometry Dash until it starts to be become overloaded with content. At this point, the game has a massive community that's sustaining itself through the level editor and YouTube content. It's somehow more popular than ever, despite the game not receiving any updates in six years. There's one more update for Geometry Dash that Robtop has been teasing since 2021, and it still hasn't released yet. It does look pretty massive though, containing features like a revamped level editor and an entirely new platforming game mode. It was announced to launch in October, but was the delayed to this month instead. You can pick any metric you want to measure the virality of Geometry Dash, but long story short, it's one of the most downloaded and profitable mobile games of all time.